few comments quickly on teams. Um, obviously, uh, we we see the argument in teams is probably embedded in the argument we had earlier with diversity. Uh, that is, different people are good at different things, and there's certain things you can only do uh, with a team. Like I can't move a grand piano by myself, but if I have a, a team of uh, large athletes, then I probably can move the piano. So some things, jobs just require a team. It's fun. There are different types of teams. Um, so I want to leave you kind of with this one thing. Uh, there's, a, there's a book called Sign Chaos. I just forgot the guy's name. Crepes. He's a general. Anyway, uh, he has this... Uh, he has this idea in uh, the book. You guys from Washington, Tri Cities, Camp David Space, not his name. Jim Mattis. Jim Mattis, right? Secretary of Defense. He's a central grad. That's right. Wildcat Pride. Um, so he honed in on this idea of commander's intent. He would say, I had so many teams, I had thousands of people that I was in charge for. I can't go around and tell everybody how to do their jobs. It's not realistic. The idea is do they know the strategy? Do they know what's in my head, my intentions? And if they do, when they're off in the sticks or they're off in the desert or they're off, you know, in a submarine or somewhere, they don't have to call home and check, is this okay, boss? Because they know my intent. And so one of his kind of recommendations that I found particularly insightful in this book um, was everybody on your team at any point from the very top to the very bottom, they need to know your intentions. You're not going to be able to spell it out in each one of their individual jobs. Um, so when you sit down with a team, I did this um, long before the book was written. I wasn't aware of these words, but I sit down with a team and I go, before our team meetings, I go, okay, before we start, tell me, what are we doing here? Like not we're doing our job here, but like, tell me, what is the purpose of your team? What are you guys trying to accomplish? And it was shocking because in a team of five, I might get three different answers. I go, okay, time out. We can't actually move on to the discussion until we all agree on what is the objective. Like what's in my head as your team leader that we need to accomplish? And when you get everybody on the same page, it's like, sweet. You don't have to call me twice a day to say, what should I do next, boss? Because you have, in this case, what he would call the commander's intent. So especially if you find yourself in a managerial position, uh, some of you right now are in manager, even senior manager positions. That's the big, the big concept here. Does everybody on your team know your intent? They know the purpose of whatever it is that you're setting out to do. We know the benefits of work teams. Uh, there's one that you won't find in your book that, that um, I think is really interesting. Um, there's uh, research by Gallup. There's um, their engagement scores, and it's kind of a weird use of the word. Um, but they get at this idea called job embeddedness. Um, so let's do this. So right now I live in Ellensburg, Washington. I've had maybe four or five other offers from other uh, universities, and, and I'm, I'm not going. And they're all higher money, and I don't care. I'm not going. Why am I not going? Because I have about five or six really good friends in this town, and I love them. They're a part of my life. I'm a part of their life. And that's not easy to replicate, and I'm not willing to give that up. Um, because I am 20 minutes from the mountains, and I love being in the mountains with my, with my kids. Uh, because we have a few acres, and we have dirt bikes, and my daughter changes out what pets she wants. She wants horses now. Hoping to hold off on that. Um, but changes out what pets she wants uh, all the time, and I get to do that. So I have friendships, I have hobbies, I have things that I love, and so I'm not leaving. So one of the things that the benefits that aren't really isn't really talked about is work teams is good relationships. Are there bad relationships in work teams? Of course, absolutely. But there's also good relationships and best friends are made at work. And that was one of uh, Gallup's research findings. Uh, they said their, their best predictor of turnover was the answer to the question, do you have a best friend at work? And if people said yes, they didn't quit. So lots of benefits, productivity, involvement, et cetera, yes. But don't overlook this idea of you establish actually meaningful relationships. You get people embedded in their job, which helps to reduce turnover. Okay, uh, second major thing uh, that we want to talk about. I'm looking at the time, so I'm going to try to pick up the pace a little bit. Um, so let me give a, this is the second major thing is job analysis. Uh, to me, this is the second most boring aspect of HR. Um, and yet it is the foundation of a ton of what we do in HR. So let me give you a high level real quick and then I'm going to breeze through the last uh, slides uh, much more quickly. Job analysis, think of it in your head as like a really big Microsoft Word document or a really fat three ring binder that is every single thing about the job. Who you talk to, uh, what is good performance, what's bad performance. So, so if it's Verizon cell phones and you have to sell 30 cell phones a month, who came up with that number? 
Like, how is that the idea? That has financial implications, that has recruiting implications, that has termination implications, a million implications. Well, that came from the job analysis. Um, everything about the job, the training you have to have, the knowledge, the skills, the experience. Do you have to have a PhD? Uh, can you be a high school dropout? Everything comes from this book. So this is really, really important. Um, when someone says, am I qualified for that job? The answer is found here. When someone says, how much should we pay for this job? Or that's too much or that's not enough. It comes from here. When someone says, I got fired for bad performance. Uh, what is bad performance? That's in here. Um, so in theory, every job has a job analysis. Throughout, uh, throughout the world, most job analyses, um, honestly, are either not done um, or they are way outdated. Um, and people think, oh, what's the big deal? When there's a question, this is the, like, like, this has happened multiple times. A firm fires somebody for performance. That person sues them and says, no, it was because of my race or my gender or my sexual orientation or my religion. You actually discriminated against me. And the firm says, no, we fired you because you actually stink at your job. Um, when the person sues them, I'll get calls from that firm and I have two questions for them. Number one, pull out the last three performance evaluations. What do they say? If they say on a scale of one to 10, this person was a six, then we're done here and you better settle because you're going to lose. If the firm did their job and says, no, actually, uh, we have consistently rated this person low and given them feedback and chances to improve. My second question is always the same thing. Show me the job analysis. Where are the performance uh, metrics or performance objectives in the job analysis? That's to make sure you are actually evaluating someone on what the job analysis and the job description says you're supposed to be evaluating them on. So super handy document to um, uh, to have accurate. Okay, that's my overview of job analysis. Uh, let's move a little quickly. How do we know, uh, how do we get information of what's in the job? From lots of places, multi-source, we get it from different sources. We don't go up to, you don't go to James Avery and say, hey James, give me the job description for an HR professor. I probably do things that I'm not supposed to do and I probably don't do things that I probably should do. Every incumbent is like that, right? So you get multiple sources of data, you get different types of methods, right? Use observations, um, or you take a look at a work sample, their collection of what they've produced, um, or you ask them by way of surveys or open uh, narrative models. Um, it can be adapted by different people, so you get the idea. It's really, really important to use different sources and different methods, otherwise you won't have valid data uh, and it won't be accurate. From this job analysis, we create a few things. Number one, job descriptions. Number two, job specifications. And it's used for all of this stuff down here. When a person comes in for work, do they need safety training on particular equipment? If you don't train them and they get hurt, A, you hurt somebody, and B, which is bad enough, and B, you're going to get sued. Because you're liable, you should have trained them, and you didn't. How do you know if they need training? Job analysis. Job analysis tells you what equipment they're supposed to use and if there's training needed for it. So typical areas, you can see it. There are two things we need for sure. Uh, job description, you know, obviously pay performance, but two outcomes we need from this that support the Americans with Disabilities Act, and that is the essential job functions and the marginal job functions. So you can see I'm not moving my right shoulder very much. I had a shoulder injury last uh, Friday. What is it called? Level stage three, level three, whatever, uh, AC, a AC separation. Well, it doesn't matter. I hurt my shoulder. That's all that matters. Um, so I can't move my arm a whole lot. Can I still do my job? Am I still qualified for my job? Yes. Maybe the only thing I can't do is lift up my arm to make copies on the copy machine because um, lifting seems to be the challenge. Well, that's not an essential job function. If you look at the job analysis for my job, you'll see, yeah, it's probably in there making copies. But it's not like if you can't make copies, you can't be a professor. Well, let's say we were up there and I lost the ability to talk and I got hit in the, the, the neck and the hands. I can't talk and I can't type. Well, yeah, you're going to have to find a new job, man. I'm really sorry that happened. And you probably get, you know, some kind of disability, something. But uh, you can't have that job anymore because talking and typing are actually essential job functions. If you can't do them, you can't actually uh, do the job. Really important that we get uh, those things. Essential job functions are usually considered about 20%, it's a rule of thumb, 20% or so of your time to work on a specific task, um, that is, um, that would be considered an essential job function. Okay. Mm, okay, we're good, last thing. Um, 
some issues with, with uh, job analysis. So when you're going to do this, if you hear this lecture and you go, oh man, I'm so pumped up. I'm going to go do a job analysis on everyone in my company. Yeah, wait, hold off. Give me a call. Let's talk first because um, it's cumbersome and expensive and helpful. But anyway, here's the things to think about. Number one, when people do a job analysis, they usually focus on the person in the job. No, this is not a person analysis. This is a job analysis. I was thinking about this the other day in terms of, of uh, like presidential stuff. Right, if you did a you did a uh, a job analysis on the president of the United States, compare George Bush what he normally did to Barack Obama to what he normally did um, to Donald Trump, just their styles and what he normally does. They use different modes of communication, right? Uh, they have very different um, uh, kind of orator and, and charisma abilities. Uh, some of them are much more technical in their analysis. Some of them rely on their gut much more. Some of them rely on uh, relationships much more. So. So if you actually did a job analysis on the President of the United States, you come up with three completely different models. Um, you should probably actually start with a you know a constitution or something. Um, but the big idea here is uh, it's not a person analysis, it's a job analysis. Don't assume the person doing the job is doing all parts of the job, and don't assume that everything they do should actually fit in the job. Second, the inflation of jobs and job titles. So Obviously, if you ask me, if you do job analysis on James Davey, I would tell you I am shaping the minds and the hearts of the next generation of world leaders who will solve the most complex problems and restore peace and harmony and flourishing. That's what I do. I mean, I don't know what you do, but that's what I do as a professor. Um, but if you were to ask somebody else what I do, they'd probably say, oh, he teaches HR, right? Which, of course, is the same thing as what I just said. When you interview people about their job, they will always make it sound much more, not always, usually make it sound much more important uh, than it actually is. And it's not like they're all arrogant jerks. It just has to do with maintaining self-esteem, psychological process. So you got to be aware of that. Um, the last one is that both employees and managers get concerned when you do a job analysis. So it's important to explain it, what you're doing, why you're doing it, stuff like that. Employees, obviously, if you go to me as an employee, say, now tell me exactly everything you do, all the equipment that you use, all the training that you've had, what's my thought? My thought is, you're firing me or you're replacing me. So I get a little nervous and don't really want to cooperate. Um, hopefully to explain to employees what you're doing, why you're doing it. Um, next, uh, managers. You, If you've ever applied to a job, looked at a job description, you're going to see a beautiful phrase on there, on most of them, on the bottom that says, and you have to do this, this, the job requires this, 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 and it'll say, and other duties as assigned. You've seen that? And other duties, or remember TDRs, maybe it'll say and other responsibilities as assigned. And you go, why is that there? And some employees will think that is there so the manager can tell me to do anything and I am supposed to do it. It's all of a sudden part of my job. Sort of. That is there usually as a result of a job analysis where a manager looked at a job description and said, wait a second. Like sometimes it's helpful for our team if if our group does X or Y or Z. It may happen once a year, it may happen once every six months, but if we don't do it, it's it's damaging to our team and we need to do it and that's not on here. And an HR person will say, it's not really a part of the job. So we kind of create this big open-ended category that says, and other duties as a sign. That usually satisfies managers that feel like they're kind of they're kind of locked up and they can't even ask employees on their team to do work-related tasks because it wasn't in that one document. So, a few behavioral aspects of job analysis uh, for you to consider, and that will do it for chapter four. Have a great day.